the stuff they talked me into. <laughs> no, I like to have a good time. If you've ever been on a mission trip with me, you know that I'm a, I like to cut up and, you know, try not to take myself too seriously uh, because it seems like I'm serious most of the time, but I, I'm really not. And, you know, this, this series that we're in, though, is, is really uh, one of those things that I think we all need to hear because uh, all of us face different temptations. And what I have discovered in talking to Christians and people who go to church and people who've been Christian for years is we seem to get stuck with certain habits and hangups. And uh, we seem to have these recurring things that lure us away from God. And over these next four weeks, if you will give me four weeks, I promise you, God is going to break you free from some things in your life that's been cap holding you captive for maybe years. And I know that, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things going on in your life, but this is the one thing that will change your life, not just tomorrow, but for the rest of your life. And as we begin to dive into that, I sort of want to tell you something that, you know, I've been... Uh, walking through with this Carrollton plant, uh, you know, uh, there, I think just, I was actually watching him on the, on one of the guy's phones back there. I said, hey, you know, what's going on in Carrollton? So he pulled it up and uh, I couldn't see everything, but I could hear Justin. But two years ago, we were talking about starting a Carrollton campus and we got time or to the sort of the date where either you're going for it or you're not, because there's not going to be enough time if we don't. And we decided not to because, you know, we didn't have the resources, you know, it just didn't feel like that, that we could pull it all together. Um, so we put it off. Well, this year, that same time frame came around and the same conversations were going on. And so I finally just said, you know what, guys, I said, August, we're starting a Carrollton campus and whatever we have in August is what we're going to do. And so we're just going for it because unless you just take that decision to step out on faith, then you'll never step out because it, everything never lines up, right? Uh, it's like having kids, you know, when everything's right, we're going to have kids. Now, we, you're going to have them anyway, and then everything will work out. So we, um, we decided to do that. And of course, we, were, we had nothing in the budget for it. So you got, there's a lot of stuff you got to buy in order to pull a church service off. Um, and so we took our offering up in December and we, you know, got uh, a good sum of money. So we put that back and we began to calculate and we took up another offering and you guys were generous and began to give. And so uh, what God did is out of nothing, uh, I think we finally get to somewhere around $70,000 that we invested in this launch of our other campus. And this morning it's happening and people are sitting there and their lives that are going to be changed. But I wanted to tell you that because sometimes you guys may think that I sit up here and I don't have any kind of temptations in my life. I have the same temptations that you do, the same temptations to say, you know, God, I just, I just, I don't know if we can do that, you know. And your tendency is want to cower back from what God's challenging you to do. But when you step out beyond yourself, then you can see what God can do. And I, I, I never, and when we get to the point where we can't do this as a church, then I'm the wrong leader for this church because I always want to be that person that's challenging us and stretching us to do things greater than what we could do ourselves because we got to see God move. And that's what church is all about. And this series though is, is about those kind of temptations, about the temptations like I face where it's like, you know, God, can we, can we, or should we? And, and we sort of start pulling back because when we talk about temptation, uh, there's, something, there's something that we need to understand before we can even begin to combat it. And we're going to talk about this morning. But I think the Apostle Paul sort of describes our temptation. If you read uh, in Romans chapter 7, when he says, he says, you know, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. And I thought, man, that is a great 
statement about temptation, you know, because here are the things I don't want to do. Why do I keep doing the things that I don't want to do? And why can't I do the things that I do want to do? And that seems to be the plight of the Christian life. Now, now Paul was not an ordinary guy, right? I mean, he's, he's got several books in the Bible that God inspired him to write. And so here he is telling us this about temptation so that we can understand it. And so what I want to ask you this morning, though, as we jump into this series is, is what is it for you? What is that thing in your life that you keep going back to? That you're saying, God, you know, why does this keep controlling? And for some of us, listen, it might just be an attitude. You're that glass half empty person. And you think that's your spiritual gift. That is not a spiritual gift, okay? I'm just real about everything. No, no, you're, you, you're, you're, you're not doing what God wants you to do. God wants you to have eyes of faith, right? He wants you to see what could be, not everything that just is, because if you just see what is, you'll never see what could be. And so in your life, you know, maybe you're one of those people that, that listen, you're just angry all the time. You're, you're angry at the world. And God wants to do something different in your life. And so maybe that's the thing in your life God's wanting to conquer. Um, or maybe, it, maybe it's an addiction that you have. And, you know, you're thinking, if anything could happen in this next four weeks, I would want to overcome this. Or for some of you, listen, maybe you want to be that parent that's encouraging to your kids, but every time you turn around, you seem to be yelling at them. And maybe that's the thing you need to overcome in your life is, you know what, you need to speak truth into them. You need to speak words that build them up. And, and that's what your heart's desire is, but for some reason you keep clicking back to this other mode. And so maybe that's the thing in your life that, uh, that you want God to, to conquer in you. Or, or maybe you just, let's listen, you want to quit drinking or quit smoking or quit those things that are destroying your body. So, well, I didn't know those were sin. This is God's temple. He loaned it to you. So take care of it. So there's some things that maybe you need to get rid of that you haven't been able to. Our temptations are the very thing that God wants to conquer and has conquered for us, but we just haven't sometimes learned how to walk in that. In the next four weeks, we're going to do that. But I want to start right now by stopping and praying. And as I pray, I want you where you are to talk to God and say, God, this is the very thing that I want to overcome in the next four weeks in my life. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we're all in this room and we're all people that are walking through life. And Lord, I know there are some here this morning that are struggling with alcoholism, that are struggling with attitudes, and mindsets, and pride. And Lord, I pray, God, that over the next four weeks, Lord, that they and us together would walk in such a way that we experience victory. Lord, I pray that you'd release us in the name of Jesus and that we, we would walk in that victory, God, that we'd no longer be held captive by those things that so easily entangle us, God. And Lord, I just ask you right now, as we're praying, I pray the same thing for Carrollton, God. I pray for that person that's walking in the room that's, that's struggling with that addiction, God. I pray for that person that's been looking for hope and joy in their life and peace and meaning. I pray, God, that they would be released this morning to find that in Jesus Christ, Lord. And I pray the same thing in this room, that, God, you do a supernatural work in our lives this morning. And, God, that you would speak into our lives in such a way that we hear your voice and we listen. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. But you know, one of the things about temptation that I think we all have to come to terms with is that when, when we discuss temptation, God's very clear about the nature of it. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, no temptation has seized you or overcome you except that which is common to man. And so what God wants us to understand is, is that all of us in this room are subject to temptation, okay? There's nobody immune from it. You know, when you stand on this stage, that doesn't mean you're immune from it. All of us face it. And you need to understand that because some people think, you know what? I'm the only one that goes through this. I'm the only one that's encountered this. And what we do is we give ourselves permission to have a pity party because we think that we're the only ones that are struggling with something. I want you to understand the party's over, okay? 
Everybody's sitting in this room in the same situation. But what God wants to understand when he says that it's common to man, it doesn't mean that it's the same exact temptation, okay? So you might be tempted with something different than I'm tempted with, but he's saying it's common because all of us face it. And this word common simply means it's, it's human. In other words, it's, it's natural for every human being to face temptation. And we're going to see why that is so here in a few minutes. But I think it's important that we grasp that we're all on the same page so we don't miss out on understanding each other. Because oftentimes we look at other people and we judge them because they're tempted by something that we're not. And we make ourselves out to be this holy person because, you know, I, I don't struggle with drinking or I don't struggle with this. And, I, you know, I can't believe they do that. Well, then we turn around with our temptation and we minimize it and maximize theirs like they got something wrong with them when we're all in the same boat. And so what God's saying, listen, stop judging other people, okay? Amen. 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 Why? Because we're not ready to fight the battle until we're ready to understand what's going on with us and stop looking at everybody else. And so in this process, as we begin to dive into this communication about temptation, what we got to understand is, is that everybody's tempted by something different. Now, some of you You love gummy worms. <laughs> These are organic, so they're really good, right? What does that mean? Sugar, sugar. It's not a matter if it's organic or not, right? And so, you know, here's the thing is, is the enemy, he knows what you like. So he's just waving in front of you. And some of us are like, well, you know, I'm not tempted by gummy worms. That doesn't mean anything to me. I'm not tempted by gummy worms either. I don't really like them. I mean, it tastes like you're chewing on a piece of wax. It's got sugar on it. But you know, the enemy knows what we like. And so for others of us, he just, he just changed the bait up. Oh, I guess that's mine. So when we're doing this whole process, it's like the enemy's looking at you and he's saying, well, you know, I know you don't like gummy worms, so you know what, I'm just gonna rebate the hook. And I'm going to put on there what you do like so that when I wave it in front of you, you're going to be, what would the word be? Tempted. And so he's out there just working on us, you know. And he knows what we want. He knows that Greg loves Reese's, but he knows Greg's not eating them. And so, you know what? I was uh, in somebody's office the other day, and it was their birthday, and there were like four packs of these on their desk. There's only three now, by the way. There were four packs of these. And it's like I was just sitting there thinking, you know what, those, I could actually taste them. I mean, you ever been that way? You like it so much that you can taste it and you ain't even opened the wrapper yet? And so I brought this out here because this is what happens. He just keeps waving it in front of you. You might be good one day and you would stand it, but it's still out there. And he keeps waving it. Why? Because he knows exactly what it is for you. And listen, you may not even like Reese's, but... He's going to rebate the hook for you, right? Because you know what? When you're fishing, how many of you like to fish? All right. I don't like to fish. I like to catch fish. If you had to fish too long, it's not fun anymore. Uh, but I like to catch fish. And so what I've noticed is, is you have to change, you have to change the bait periodically. Something done bit my bait. Have <laughs> right, you checked these guys backstage? They've been messing with the bait. But the enemy, he just keeps waving that around in front of you. Why? Because he knows what it is for you. You know, and some of us, we're, we're so proud. that, well, you know, I'm not tempted by that. Well, he's going to rebate the hook for you. Because he's coming after you. And I want you to grasp this. That he will keep coming until he gets you to fall unless you know how to stand. And so many of us, 
We keep biting the same bait over and over again. And, but I'm here to tell you this morning that you don't have to. And over the next four weeks, I'm going to show you how you can overcome that through the Word of God. It's not what Greg invented. It's the process that God already has. Because if he says that we're more than victorious, victorious in Christ Jesus, then he's got a way for us to walk in that victory. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I know that John's eyes are hurting over here. I'm going to sit this thing back. There's some, uh, I think there's some napkins if you guys are like drooling or something and need to clean your mouth off from that donut flying around everywhere. But I wanted to give you a practical picture of what's going on in this temptation so that we can understand it. And I want you to understand that when we're going through it, that everybody else is going through their own temptation. So there's no room for pride in the Christian life. There's no room for pride in the Christian church. And so as you're looking at other people, don't judge them about it. Walk beside them so that you can help them overcome. As a matter of fact, even our Savior was tempted. And so we're in good company and God wants us to understand this. Hebrews 4.15, he says this. He says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so Jesus was tempted. As a matter of fact, I want to read this to you uh, about his temptation in Mark 1.13. It says that he was in the desert for 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild animals and the angels attended to him. And so Satan came to tempt him, but the Bible tells us so that we understand that he was tempted in all ways just like we are. And so what he was tempted with in the wilderness might not be the temptation that would get you, but there's something the enemy knows about you that will get you. And so when Jesus was tempted, it says that he was tempted in all ways. In other words, let me give you a picture of this. When, when the, Jesus was born in the manger, uh, God allowed this birth to happen through a, a immaculate conception. And so Mary had the baby. And when Jesus was born, uh, God incarnate. In other words, God became the man or came to earth and he was fully man and fully God. And so when Jesus was here, we had God in the flesh, but we also had man. And so man was tempted through, through this, this relationship uh, the, and this connection, if you will. And so when Jesus was tempted, he, he felt the full temptation because of the flesh, because of being human. And so it wasn't that he wasn't tempted. He just had the power, the Bible says, to overcome it. And so he tells us that because he can sympathize with us. You see, sometimes we think that when we're tempted, Jesus doesn't care that we're tempted. We think that he hopes we fail so he can squash us like a bug and say, you know, I knew you couldn't do it. Now, Jesus is not looking for us to fall. Jesus is looking for us to have victory because that's why he died on the cross. And so he can sympathize with us. So think about it this way. Uh, have you ever had anybody sympathize with you You're going through a tough time and they just, you know, sort of come alongside of you? You know, sometimes when you're, we're struggling, you, maybe you've had a, a death in your family or maybe, maybe you're, you're struggling with a... Uh, something somebody said about you and it hurt your feelings and you have that friend that comes alongside of you and they just sort of put their arm around you and they say it's okay I'm right here with you and we'll walk through this together and it does something to your heart it just it sort of lets your guard down it makes you feel like that somebody cares about you that's the same term and concept that Jesus uses to describe his relationship with us. So I want you to picture yourself next time you're in temptation, Jesus come along beside you and saying, that's okay, I'm with you. We're gonna get through this. Amen. Amen. He's not over there in the shadow saying, ah, I knew you were going to blow it. You know, did it again, you sorry thing. You Can't you ever get this right? That's the other voice. That's not the voice of God. That's the accuser of the brethren, not the encourager of the brethren. And so here's Jesus drawing this picture so that we can get it. And the, the, the hope that we have is, is that Jesus was tempted in all ways just as we are, yet without what? Without sin, Right? 
And so, you know, you probably wonder why sometimes I ask you to repeat the things in the Bible. Um, you may not realize it, but God's power is in his word too, right? And so when we speak his words, we speak the power of God into situations. And so the reason I want you to go along with me with this is I want you saying God's word because there's power in his word. And when we, when we release that power, the enemy can't stand against God's power. And so that's why we say this together. And so if you, uh, you know, you're sort of not into it, I'm going to give you a lot of chances, all right? So we get good at this. So when God says that he was tempted in all ways as we were, yet without what? Sin. Without sin, he's trying to get us to understand because he could overcome it. And now that when you become a Christ follower, Christ is in you. Now that he's in you, we have the same power that overcame sin when it was tempted in, in, in this wilderness in us. And so since he could overcome it, we can overcome it. It's already dictated that we can overcome it. It's not a might. It's a, hey, if you'll follow this pathway, you will. And so God wants us to grasp that. It's not the, a battle that can't be won. It's a battle that's won, but we've yet to step in our victory in that area of our life. And God's inviting us into that victory. Amen. 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 But there's something key about this explanation that Jesus talks about when he says that, G, that, that he was tempted in all ways and that when he was in the wilderness that he was tempted for 40 days by a certain person and that person was Satan. Now, I know there's this big movement uh, in, in a lot of circles, I'm not gonna call it Christian, but in a lot of circles, religious circles, where, you know what, we don't really believe in the devil. Let me say this, if I were the devil, which I'm not, the thing that I would want to do is to get you to not believe in me. Because if you don't believe in me, you certainly aren't gonna fight against me. And so if I could convince you to think that I'm not real, then you would go around thinking that all your problems are just habits. All your problems are just addictions. And you would fight all those things, but you wouldn't fight me. And if you're not fighting me, you would never win. And so, so many Christians are fighting a battle, but they're not fighting the real battle because they've fallen into this false belief, you know, that Satan's not really, I mean, it's just written about in the Bible. It's not, that's not real. And society itself thinks that it's not real. And so, they have subjected themselves to a lifetime of submission to this person they don't think is real. And they'll ever overcome him because they don't even know that he's real. And I say that because God is very specific to point that out here so that we understand where our battle is. You see, all the stuff we're gonna talk about in the next three weeks, if you don't believe there's a real enemy out there, then you're, you're, you're gonna fall. As a matter of fact, in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be self-controlled and alert. The, your enemy, the who? Devil. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, here's, here's something you need to understand. The devil is real and he's coming after you every day of your life. He never quits. He never gives up. He wants to destroy anything he can about you as a Christian. He wants to destroy your witness so that you can't reach anybody for Jesus, so that you'll be ineffective for Jesus. He wants to destroy your marriage so that you won't be happy, so that you won't be, be joyful. He wants to destroy everything around you that you care about and everything every day of your life, I want you to understand he is coming after you. And if you think it's not real, then you've lost half of the battle already. Amen. So in this process, he tells us that he's prowling around seeking. Now I want you to understand so that you don't give the devil more credit or more power than he really has. The devil is not like God. God is omnipresent. He can be everywhere at one time and he sees everything. The devil is not that way. He can't be everywhere. 
So he needs a little help, and he has help. His spiritual forces that work with him. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, the devil's trying to get me. Well, he is trying to get you. He may not be there in person, but somebody that's representing him is, all right? And so in our lives, we've got to understand that he's not as powerful as God by any stretch of the means, and he can't be everywhere. But as it says in Ephesians 6, 12, we need to understand the full picture. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And so here's, here's the thing that we often miss that prevents us from overcoming. God says that this spiritual enemy is this force that we can't see. I want to explain this to you because this is really key in understanding how to overcome. You see, what we do in our lives is that we try to overcome things that are tempting us. And so what we want to do is we want to focus on that thing that's tempting us. And we want to conquer that, whether it's an attitude, whether it's a, a, a substance or whatever it might be. And so we keep thinking, you know what, if I just try hard enough, one day I'm going to conquer this. But what you don't realize is the battle is not against that thing, okay? That thing is just simply the thing that the enemy is using to cause you to fall. And so the battle is against the tempter. It's not the bait. It's the spiritual battle. And because we can't see him, we focus on what we can see. And that's the problem. And that's why we keep failing over and over again. We think that the victory's out there, but the victory is in the part that we can't see. And so if we're going to win the battle, it's not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle that when I win that spiritual battle, it has effects in the physical realm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we go out and get self-help books. We join groups that are out there. That everybody's trying to uh, overcome this certain thing in your life. And, you know, we read books like The Power of Positive Thinking, which, you know, there is power in that. But the thing is, is until we get to the place where we realize that our enemy is not visible, he's invisible, and we simply keep trying to fight him in the physical realm, we will lose every time. You see, I, I see this all the time in, in, uh, in marriage relationships. You get married and you say, well, I don't need to go to church anymore. Or I don't need to read my Bible anymore. And then all of a sudden you start fighting and you wonder what's wrong with them. You know, they weren't that way when you were dating. What happened to them? And y'all start button heads. You need somebody to come in and help you. And you'll go to a counselor and that counselor will start trying to help you fix all those things you can see in your marriage. When the problem with your marriage is that you've, uh, you've, you've sort of allowed God to check out of it because you said, you know what, God, I, we don't need you anymore. And what happened is, is that you have gotten to a place in your life now where you no longer have the power to fight in the spiritual realm and you've even forgot that there was a spiritual realm. You see, you can't change your kids. You can't change your wife. You can't change your husband when you just fight what you see in front of you. The only way that you can change them is through the spiritual battle that many of us don't see and many of us are unaware of and we're losing because we're fighting in the wrong realm. So God's saying, listen, church, open your eyes to realize that this battle is three-dimensional. It's not one-dimensional. Stop fighting what you see because you're not going to win. Begin to understand that the enemy who is holding the bait is where the battle is. It's not the bait itself. And so if you and I are tapping in and putting all of our energy in focusing on this bait, then we miss out because... Every temptation that we face is spiritual. It's a spiritual temptation. Temptation in its nature, you know, we might be tempted by food and we think, well, you know, that's not spiritual. But it can be. Because as we begin to destroy the temple that God's given us, it becomes spiritual. 
Because now we're no longer able to do what God wants us to do. So what happens is, is our spiritual enemy is so subtle, so subtle. And he will do anything to get his foot in the door. He will even use the things that we perceive as good and allow you to get so far into it that he reaches his ultimate goal to pull you away from God. Because temptation is always spiritual. His ultimate goal is to get you away from God. And if he can get you away from God, he can conquer you. And when we see this, this process and this temptation process, we begin to understand there's a lot going on there. There's a lot happening. As a matter of fact, when uh, Adam and Eve were in the garden, and if you go back to Genesis chapter, chapter 2 and chapter 3, you begin to read the whole story. You'll see that God said, listen, you can have anything in the garden. He had everything that they needed. Uh, all the things that would sustain them and all the things uh, relationally that they needed. They had each other. They had God. And so everything they needed. And he said, you know what? But, but I want you to understand something. There's one tree in the middle of the garden that you're not to partake of. Because the day that you do, your eyes will be open and you will know good and evil and you will experience death because then death will enter the world. And so that tree is always there and it's being dangled. Every day they walk by that tree. And then one day, the serpent came in. And he asked them a question about the tree. As Eve was there, could see the tree. He said, has God really said that you shouldn't eat of the tree? And so what he wanted to do is interject that doubt into her mind and question what God had said. And so when he, out, when he got that question in her mind, then he was able to manipulate her. But I want you to grasp this. Every temptation that comes into your mind, in my heart, in our lives, always wants us to question God's goodness, to question that God has what we need, to question his sufficiency. And so here's this questioning goes on. And then she partook of the fruit and then sent into the world and we're reaping the repercussions of that and we keep reproducing that why because she listened to the wrong voice I promise you very few people ever fall into sin without having a conversation in their head. And that kind of, amen. <laughs> and in that conversation, the question always comes up so that we'll doubt God. So that we'll choose something other than God. You see, because Temptation is always about choice. Is am I going to choose what God has for me or am I going to choose something else? And it's always a choice. And that's why we'll always be tempted until we're in the presence of God and then Satan is no more. We'll always be tempted because the ultimate question of temptation is not do I want that thing, not do I want that relationship, not do I want that substance. The ultimate temptation is, is do I want that more than I want God? And so that temptation is to lead me away from my relationship with God. And so Christians, listen, if you disconnect yourself from God's word, you disconnect yourself from God's church, you set yourself up for failure. I want you to know that. You are setting yourself up and you think it was you that made a decision. But if I were Satan, which I'm not, you know what I would do? exactly what he does in scripture you look in the book of Genesis and you can look through a lot of the scenarios you look at King David and you look at Jesus there's a common factor in every one of their temptations and that common factor is is they were alone you see when people commit suicide they typically do it when they're what alone, alone. why 
Because that's when his voice can get into you and you'll begin to listen to it and you've you forget the voice of God. You forget what God tells you. And so you wonder why we talk about groups here at Crossroads. Well, why do we talk about groups is because together we're stronger. Together we're stronger. And when you and I, the Bible tells us that two are greater than one. And when you have a three-strand cord and you bind it together, it's even stronger. And so we need each other. You see, the church is about us together overcoming. Because you're going to have weak times when the enemy starts throwing suggestions into your mind. When he starts talking to you. When he gets you to start questioning God. And you need somebody that's beside you to say, you know what? That's not the right voice. Let me tell you what God says. We need each other to be able to do that together. And so when we talk about standing together, standing against temptation, that's what the group life is all about. But if I were Satan and I'm not, you know what I'd do? I'd get you so busy that you don't have time to be in a group. I'd get you so distracted that you don't have time to read your Bible. I would make you think that you have more important things that you need to get done. Good things. You see, I would keep you away from other people by getting you to do as many things as you could with your kids so that you can't be a part of God's body. And you think I'm saying that so that you'll feel guilty. I'm saying that because that's exactly what happens in Scripture. What God wants us to do is open our eyes. Open our eyes to the battle that's going on. And listen, this is not a game. This is not a, oh, you know what, what's the big deal about temp temptation will take your life. Temptation will take your joy. Temptation will take your marriage. Temptation will destroy your family. Temptation will lead your kids into drugs and alcohol and all this other stuff. Temptation is for real because Satan is for real. And he came to seek you out and to kill, steal, and destroy. So if you think it's a game, one day you're going to wake up and realize it's a reality in your life. And God is trying to rescue us from that. And that's why he's telling us this in Scripture. So we'll open our eyes and we'll see that, you know what, this is, this is something that's coming after me every day of my life. It's not something I can avoid, but I have to come at it head on. And in order to do that, I've got to understand the reality of what's happening. That the enemy wants me to surrender my control of my life to him and not God. So every temptation is always a choice. And when I choose what I'm tempted with, I want you to get this, I'm choosing Satan over God. It's not just a drink. It's not just a relationship. It's me saying, God, no to you, and yes to my spiritual enemy, Satan. You say, but Greg, it's not. No, it is exactly that. And we need to see that. We need to understand that. When you choose it, know what you're choosing. Because what we're choosing is to say, you know what? I'm going to let you have control of my life. Listen to this. For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they, are divine, they have divine power to demolish the strongholds. You see, what we are fighting, the things that you can't overcome in your life, the thing that you keep fight, butting up against where you say, you know what, I, why do I still struggle with this? Why do I? Those are strongholds in your life. Those are the things that you can't break free from. And you try to, but you can't. And God says, those are the things that are controlling you and that's what a stronghold does it controls you so if you get somebody and you're uh, wrestling with them and you get them in a submission hold why do they submit because they can't break free and so you and I have gotten uh, in these places in our life where we've been submitting because we can't break free and we think we don't have the power to break free but God says that they're only broken by what kind of power divine power So the hope that we have is in God, in His power. And so you and I, we have to realize these strongholds in my life are not just things that I just decided to do. It's bigger than that. 
There's a spiritual element in everything that happens in this world. Do you realize that? That this enemy that we don't see, and you know, we, we, we think that it's just life. We think it's just doing life. We think it's just, you know, this is what I like to do. This is what I enjoy. And guys say, no, it's bigger than that. You have strongholds. Alcohol addiction is a stronghold. Pornography is a stronghold. Sexual addiction is a stronghold. Anger is a stronghold. Depression is a stronghold. Bitterness is a stronghold. All of these things are strongholds in our life. Eating disorders are strongholds. They're destructive habits that are strongholds. All those things are where we decide, you know what? It's no big deal. But it is. Because it owns you. And when it owns you, this is what I know about you. The joy in your life gets sucked right out. The peace in your life gets sucked right out. And God has so much more for you. He has the ability to step into your world and break those strongholds, to demolish them. And that's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for those that are watching online this morning. He wants to come in to your life and break down those strongholds so that they don't control them. But here's the thing is, just coming to church is not enough. Just going to the bookstore and getting a self-help book is not enough. Just wishful thinking is not enough. It's only God's supernatural power in our lives. You know, that's why I encourage you to say, hey, hey, be here all four weeks. Why? Because some of you show up the first week, you think, you know, that was great. But you don't do anything with it. Well, why is it great then? You know what would be great? You know what would be really great? If you woke up tomorrow morning and that habit wasn't in your life anymore. If you woke up tomorrow morning and you walked in victory. That'd be great, wouldn't it? If the next time that devil started dangling that thing in front of your face, if you looked at that thing and said, you know what, I know, I've seen this before, and it's not this, but it's you, and in the name of Jesus, get out of my life. But you and I have to think differently to do that. We have to begin to have our, our lives transformed by God's power to break down these strongholds. And, and then we begin to experience that kind of life that I know you're looking for, because that's what I'm looking for. Can I tell you this? <laughs> I found it. Does that mean the temptation left? Absolutely not. It means he's, he's torquing it out even harder. But I know his voice. And I know my Savior's voice. And that Savior's voice is so much clearer than his voice. Because I get up every morning and I listen to his voice have a conversation with him and he speaks to me through his words but here's the thing I want to say this not to be mean not to be mad not to put you down if you are here this morning and you have that thing in your life that keeps controlling you and you want to overcome it so bad you want to be that great wife but you want to be that great husband but you want to be that great student but all those things that keep creeping into your life are, are, are dominating you and you know they're not right but you just can't seem to break free can I tell you this morning that you will never ever ever break free from that it will control you the rest of your life there is no hope for you to get out there is no hope for you to get free unless you have a relationship with Jesus Christ amen now now listen please listen it's not if you think you have one if you never experienced the power of God in your life you may have raised your hand, you may have walked down the aisle, you may have been baptized, you may have done it two or three times, but you've never experienced God's power in your life. You've never seen the fruit of what God can do in your life. If you've never had that, then I want you to know something. It doesn't matter if you think you got it, if you don't. It doesn't matter if you're 99.9% .9 sure you know Jesus, but that 1% is the part that you don't really know him. So you gotta know that you know him because if you're gonna stand in the battle, you gotta know that you know that he's standing with you. Amen. So before we go anywhere in this series, if you are sitting here and you doubt that you know Jesus, then you need to make sure this morning. 
You don't need to leave this building doubting. You need to know for certain. And you don't need to talk yourself in. You know, I just need to rededicate my life. You can't dedicate what was never dedicated, all right? You can't give him what you never gave him. If you give it to him, give it to him. And so this morning, if you need to start this process and you want to break free, then the process is to be honest with God and say, Jesus, this morning, I don't even know if I really know you. I think I do, but I don't really know. Wouldn't it be great if you left here knowing that you knew the Savior of the world and that you were going to overcome that thing in your life because he already overcame it for you. Amen. And so I just want to ask you to bow your heads for just a minute. And I want you to be totally honest. Listen, I don't get anything extra by you making this decision except the joy of knowing that God changed your life this morning. So if you're here and you've got those doubts and your life, you still got all that junk in your life and you wonder why it keeps controlling you and you don't think you have that power because you're not really certain you know Jesus. You're not 100% sure. You might be 99%, but there's that doubt in your mind and you feel it creeping up right now. If that's you, and you want to be sure this morning of that relationship with Jesus so that you can go on this journey with us, and it starts with life change this morning, would you just raise your hand so I can pray with you? Just raise your hand up high. Hold it up while you got Just raise it up. Don't be ashamed. There you go. Raise it up. There you go. God's going to release you. Listen, it starts right now. There's somebody holding your hand down and you know you need to raise it. So just don't listen to that voice, okay? There you go. Come on. All across the room. Everybody else is praying. Got your heads bowed. You got your hand raised right now. I want you in one swoop to look up here at me and stand up at the same time. But I want to see your eyes. Stand up to your feet. Got your hand raised. Stand up. Got your hand raised. Stand up. Stand up. Over here. Stand up. Stand up. There you go. There you go. Don't be ashamed. This is the best thing you could ever do in your life, right? With your hands still up, I want you to put the other one up. This morning, we're going to pray together. And all that stuff you've been hanging on to, you're going to release this morning because that's what you got in your hands, nothing, okay? And what you're going to do with those hands, you're going to embrace Jesus this morning. So I want you to pray with me right now where you stand and say, Dear Jesus, this morning I surrender my life to you. I give you my sin. I give you my habit. I give you my attitude. I give you my heart. Jesus, I ask you to save me. I believe you died for me on the cross, Jesus. To change my life. To give me hope. I believe you rose from the dead that I might have life. And this morning, I embrace you with all my heart to be my Savior. With your hands raised, would you look up here at me? If you're really serious about this, we got some information that we need to give you so that you can grow in this. You can take your next step, okay? I want to ask you, if you're really serious, just to step out now. i got people in the back. They're going to give you some information. So just step out now. This is the day that defines the rest of the days of your life. Go ahead and just walk straight to the back. Once you step out now, walk straight back. let's stand to our feet if you would some of you walked in here this morning carrying stuff in your life that brings no glory to God whatsoever and you know you don't need to leave here with that and so I want to invite you to come down to this front kneel down before God and say God I am leaving it I confess it is sin and this week God or this next month I want God to find the tools and the walk that I can overcome this permanently in my life through the power of Jesus Christ because I need that divine power to break this stronghold if that is your heart this morning when we sing this song you just step out don't worry about anybody else we have some folks down here to pray with you and so this is your opportunity so let's go ahead and start moving